Portlanders. It's, it's great to be here. I have not been here since we did the original series. I mean, your city, Powell's didn't exist then, so I couldn't have been here. Yes, it time. did. Oh, but, but in a different location. In no, 1989. It was somewhere else, wasn't it? No. I, anyway, I, got I, I could have been here, but I wasn't. Not through any fault of my own. Um, it's great to see all of you. I'm so glad that we could gather in this high temple of literature that is Powell's books. Um, it's, it, it is my first visit. I'm overwhelmed by it. Um, you are very lucky to have this as a resource in your city. And I'm, I can see that you all take great advantage of it. So looks like synergy is going on there, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, I always begin with my uh, favorite quote from one of my favorite human beings, Groucho Marx. <laughs> Outside of a book, a dog is man's best friend. Outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. <laughs> now, somebody's been posting that on the internet, so I'm always afraid my jokes are going to be blown before I get to them. Um, I also want to say thank you to all the fans who've kept this thing alive all this time. It's a quarter of a century. Um, I'm guessing three or four of you weren't born then. <laughs> but the, the notion that this series got to you in some way and it haunted your dreams or it filled your days or whatever it did, this has all come back because of you and I want you to give yourselves a hand. <laughs> of giving back. And this book is really the first course of what I hope is a massive smorgasbord you're going to have in the next year or so when we come back with the show on Showtime next year. Um, we don't know exactly when, we don't even know exactly how many episodes yet, but you will get a uh, e-ticket ride, as they used to say, at Disneyland uh, next year. So you have that to look forward to. Um, so, do you have your books yet? Anybody have books? Oh, yeah. All right, well, let's open our hymnals to page seven. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a strange book befitting a strange series. It's what's called an epistolary novel, meaning it's, it's comprised of documents and found articles and newspapers and journals, all told through the lens of the person who has collected these things into a narrative that tells the story of this strange town and the region um, that gave rise to it. Um, you will meet that character as you read the book, and it's kind of your task to figure out who this person is. There's a mystery within a mystery here. Um, the, the dossier has been found by the FBI and has been annotated by an FBI agent who is trying to analyze it and get to the same, at the bottom of the same mystery that you're about to be tasked with. Um, it's certainly the strangest thing I've ever written. Um, I had so much fun doing it, and I hope you have fun diving in. So let's begin. The dossier, opening statement. A wise man once told me that mystery is the most essential ingredient of life for the following reason. Mystery creates wonder, which leads to curiosity, which in turn provides the ground for our desire to understand who and what we truly are. The search for meaning at the heart of life brings us to the contemplation of an eternal enigma. Mysteries are the stories we tell ourselves to contend with life's resistance to our longing for answers. Mysteries abound. This continent, this country, our own earthly origins are all laden with them, underlying our existence, predating all our childish notions of history. Mythology precedes our access to historical or scientific fact, and we know now, fulfilled much the same function for earlier civilizations, providing meaning in the face of a remorseless, indifferent universe. But in the absence of scientifically verifiable fact, it is necessary 
to sometimes view them as one and the same. So it is best to start at the beginning, so signed and duly sworn, the archivist. This is the person uh, who you will be in pursuit of as you, as you go through this. Now, uh, making this an epistolary novel gave me the opportunity to tell the story through many voices. You'll remember the show, we had over 75 regular characters. Uh, we've got the same thing here, and one of the great joys of this has been revisiting some of those voices and also adding new ones as we tell the historical chronicle that gave rise to the town of Twin Peaks. This happens to be the voice of Chief Joseph of the Nez Pierce, the great Chief Joseph, uh, who unfortunately was in the way of the encroaching Western civilization when it arrived here. Um, I'm going to play you a clip and see if you can identify who this voice belongs to. I have tried to save you from suffering and sorrow. We are few and they are many. You can see all that we have at a glance. They have goods and ammunition in abundance. We must suffer great hardship and loss. I will go now to the place known to our ancestors, seldom visited, the place of smoke by the great falls and the twin mountains, to seek aid of the great spirit chief in this time of need. Raise your hand if you think you know who that was. <laughs> Say it all, all at once. Michael. Correct. Michael uh, was actually at our signing in San Francisco two nights ago. I'm sorry you weren't there. He was great. Um, it was wonderful to see him. So we move forward in time through this period, through the 19th century, until we finally start to meet some of the people that you got to know during the series. Um, and their voices then take over and bring us almost to the present day. Let's play you this second clip and uh, see if you can figure out who this might be. This is from a private diary entry. Uh, if you like to look at the page and cheat a little, it's page 75, um, dated June 21st, 1927, and here we go. Dear Diary, this is the section of my story that they left out of the printed edition in the Gazette. They told me at the time that they ran out of space, but I think it probably had a whole lot more to do with the fact that Douglas Milford was at the time living in sin with Pauline Cuyo the estranged daughter of the owner of the Gazette. We examined the footprints in the mud, and I took my photographs. Scoutmaster Milford, looking off into the woods, now told me a story about a camping trip his younger brother, Douglas, had taken in the same location six months ago. Although both brothers had worked with the Boy Scouts for years, Douglas no longer served as a Scoutmaster. Scoutmaster Milford told me the reason was that Douglas had recently been asked to leave the Scouts after an unseemly incident having to do with said camping trip, which Scoutmaster Milford said highlighted a lamentable defect in his brother's character. It was no secret among Scouts that the Milford brothers had a complicated relationship, so I listened and asked no questions. Earlier that year, Douglas came back from said camping trip with a wild story about having encountered what he called a giant in the forest. Given that Douglas had always been prone to fanciful and chronic exaggeration, this latest example of a tall tale was discounted by Duane and everyone else. That provoked greater protestations from Douglas, including an even more outlandish claim that on the same trip he'd also come across a walking owl that he told Duane was nearly as tall as a man. Douglas also swore he'd captured photographic evidence of both creatures but it turned out the film in his camera had been prematurely exposed. He blamed this on the dark room at the Milford family pharmacy, suggesting that it was Duane's fault for improperly mixing the chemicals. Douglas also said having the pictures didn't really matter because he had a photographic memory, which Duane confirmed. His brother does have near total recall and remembered every last detail. In the weeks that followed, Douglas would sometimes vanish from home for days. Dwayne believed his brother might have been sneaking up to these woods again. 
The next month, Douglas brought this incident up at a regional scoutmaster council in Spokane. Interrupting the proceedings and demanding that unless the scouts launched an all-out investigation into the matter, he would bring it before the National Scoutmaster Council. Dwayne tried to calm down his agitated brother, but sadly the evening ended with Douglas decking Dwayne with a right cross, at which point he was removed, kicking and shouting from the scout hall. So the author of uh, this article, which appeared in the Gazette, uh, uh, or actually this section was cut, uh, you knew later as Andrew Packard, who along with his sister Catherine, played by Piper Laurie, owned the Packard Sawmill. Andrew was played by the late great um, Dan O'Hurley. Um, the brothers he's talking about in question, uh, you might have a clue, well I'll give you a clue um, as to one of them was, is this thing on? <laughs> that, that I don't remember was uh, uh, Dwayne Melford, the longest serving mayor in Twin Peaks history. I think he had something like 14 consecutive terms in office. And his troublesome, vexing brother, Douglas, uh, you also met in season two. You might remember he impulsively married Lana Budding, uh, Miss Twin Peaks 1989, or at least the runner-up. Uh, had a whirlwind romance, and after a, uh, I guess a delightful wedding night in the bridal suite at the Great Northern, uh, Douglas died with his boots on, <laughs> and that was uh, the last he was heard from. Now, Douglas, oddly enough, although a minor character in the series, is someone who will actually carry you through this whole book, and I think you'll be interested to learn more about this very interesting and mysterious figure. Uh, this is what the archivist had to say about him just after this incident. Many in this in town to this day believe it was no phantom Bigfoot in the woods that derailed the life of Douglas Milford, but the demon rum. Anecdotal evidence from residents during this period frequently mentioned Douglas and booze in the same breath. Uh, for a while there in the late 1920s, to state it more plainly, the younger Milford brother became the town drunk. Douglas left Twin Peaks after the crash of 29 when the depression hit, riding the rails, drifting from city to city, a man without a home, a family, or any apparent purpose, a not uncommon fate for the rootless during that dire decade of the 1930s. Little is heard from Douglas until he next turns up in San Francisco, where he enlisted in the Army the day after Pearl Harbor in 1941. He spent the war years in a quartermaster's brigade in the Army Air Corps, island hopping across the Pacific as the Allies turned back the tide against the Japanese. Uh, he apparently survived the war intact because he next turns up at the Army Bear Base in nearby, well not nearby, to here, Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947. Records indicate he was working at the base's PX at the time, now a corporal in the Army Air Force, but questions remain about what he was actually doing there. What is clear is that he was present on the base at the time of the infamous Roswell UFO crash, and his name appears on a list of people who were interviewed by military officers in the days after whatever happened out there happened. What follows is the only transcript of that interview with Doug Milford. This correspondent, through strenuous effort, has been able to locate. The interview was conducted on July 8th, shortly after the crash, the interviewer appears to have been a regular Army lieutenant, though not specifically identified. It also seems clear that at the time, Douglas was being held in some kind of informal custody. 00073 interview form, reference 221912, date 8th July 1947. Interviewer redacted, interviewee Corporal Douglas Milford. Please state your name and rank. Corporal Douglas James Milford, Army Air Forces. Where do you reside? Here on the base, Roswell Field. Are you married, Mr. Milford? I'm married, but I wouldn't say I'm a fanatic about it. <laughs> hey, pal, can I have some Java? This servant in the brig is like cat piss. Please tell us of your experience in the early morning of July 5th, 1947. Well, I'm working the early shift on the register, right? And all through the pre-dawn rush, we're hearing scuttlebutt that some sort of top secret test craft or something even stranger had crashed out in the desert during a thunderstorm. 
From whom did you hear this? Everybody, really. Nobody in particular. Anyone coming into the PX. Word was they'd been tracking some strange bogeys on radar the past few days, but this was something extra heavy. You knew that right away. Then about an hour before dawn, the MPs and some hotshot flyboy rush in and shut down the whole cantina. Hush, hush, mom's the word. Did you notice this officer's name or rank? Major, I guess, judging by the brass on his collar, but none of us knew the guy, and if he was wearing a name tag, I didn't notice it. What did you do then? I helped close up shop, then went out back for a smoke, but found I couldn't stop thinking about this. Always been that way. Curiosity eating away at me. The whole base had a tit and a ringer high alert, so I borrowed a Willis from the motor pool, snuck out the back gate, and drove out there myself for a look -see. How did you know where to go? There was a convoy of vehicles scrambling out that way, heading northwest. It was still dark, so I just fell in and followed them at a discreet distance. How far did you travel? Maybe 35 miles. You could see lights over the hills ahead, so once I got close, I slipped off the road, came in a back way onto the sheep ranch where everybody was headed. What did you see, Mr. Milford? Well, I came over this rise, off-road at this point, and looking down, I saw this debris field stretched out across a low plain for two, three hundred yards. What sort of debris field? A crash site, that was obvious. A big, shallow trench had been gouged into the ground as long as a football field. You could hear the hum of a generator, and all around it, lights they set up were picking up pieces of bright, shiny metal. Strange material. Unconventional looking, to say the least. MPs were scrambling to set up a perimeter, and off in the distance, I could spot a big clusterfuck of Air Force personnel bunched around something. Could you see exactly what they were doing? Hey, pal, can I bum a smoke? Thanks. Now, I was a good distance away, over a quarter mile, but they were gathered around some kind of intact craft that had gone nose up into an embankment. Looked kind of like a flying wing shape, like an old Curtis. I pulled out a pair of field glasses and zeroed in. Saw they were trying to lift this thing with a crane out of the embankment and moving on to a flatbed. Was it a plane? Couldn't tell. What else did you notice? Soldiers milling all around, real chaotic scene, and I noticed they're all wearing gas masks. Some of them were combing through the debris trail, but others were moving around things lying on the ground close to the wreckage. Could you identify what they were? Your guess is as good as mine. Or better. What did they do with these things? They were loading them into the back of some ambulances that were waiting nearby. You never saw what they were? No, sir. But some of them they were putting into bags and a couple they were loading on the stretchers. Then a big black car with a motorbike escort jams up and parks nearby. By this time they'd loaded the craft onto the flatbed and were covering it with a tarp. This guy hops right out, ram her out straight, takes a gander at the craft, and marches right over the ambulances. Did you recognize the officer? I didn't say it was an officer. Did you recognize the man who exited the car? Not at first. When I got back, I realized his picture was hanging up in the PX. Who was it? Is it okay to say? Just state what you saw, please. It looked to me like it was General Twining. General Nathan F. Twining? Commander of Air Material Command? Yes, sir, that General Twining. What did the general do when he first arrived on the scene? He takes a quick peek inside the ambulance and starts barking orders. They closed up the doors and drove off. No siren, but they left in a hurry. Then he walked over toward the wreckage. At that point, a wave of MPs pour over the hill behind me and I get knocked on the head. Next thing I know, I'm wearing cuffs in the back of a paddy wagon. Listen, no disrespect, sir, but would you mind if I spoke briefly to your superior officer? Why? You could tell him this isn't the first time I've seen something like this. Douglas Milford. Um, we'll follow him for quite some time, from Roswell all the way to the office of Richard Nixon in 1968. Um, as you can tell, you've been hearing some of these voices. Michael Horse, all of the original cast who are in the book have come back to, to voice the audiobook. And uh, we've also used all actors who are also going to be new to you who are appearing in the new series. Uh, that was a great actor by the name of Rob Nepper, who you'll get to meet next year. Um, there are also some other familiar voices. We're going to uh, meet one of them right now. Doctor and patient. 
after losing her eye while recuperating in Calhoun Hospital. Nadine was assessed for the first time in her adult life by a licensed psychiatrist. Dr. Lawrence Jacoby had returned to Twin Peaks from the island of Oahu in Hawaii in 1981 after the death of his mother, Leilani, and established a private practice in town as well as a consulting residency at the local hospital. Dr. Lawrence Jacoby, 11-29-87, p.m. Nadine Gertz Hurley, married. Date of birth, January 25th, 1950. Female, 37, five foot six inches, 112 pounds. Wow, patient is really whacked out. Poor thing. I mean, she is hip deep in this shit. Husband shot out her left eye a couple of weeks ago. Hunting accident, or at least that's their story about it. And it doesn't ring altogether true, so there is plenty of room for skepticism once you get past the particulars. Husband's the sturdy, stolid, patriarchal type, classic blue collar, strong, silent, upstanding, Vietnam vet, but non-combatant. Not to suggest for a second that he shot her on purpose, but someone made a choice here. And my money's on Nadine. She's a thwarted, creative with severe blockages and neurotic adaptations. No doubt from family history, which I will try and take some time to inventory. Working hypothesis, the left eye is wired to the right side of the brain. So in the event a choice was made, patient has chosen to shut down the optic pathway to her intuitive side. One possible interpretation would be that she was sensing something going on around her that she didn't want to see. The injury will likely prompt a period of intense suffering as it seems, she was already predominantly left brain dominant. And the right side is now literally flying blind. Since we almost know there's no such thing as an accident, and there's a positive side to every negative choice, let's dance with the idea that perhaps she willed the loss of her eye to stimulate internal growth in her area of greatest deficit. We all choose our fate, even if, well, to quote Beetle Paul with St. Paul, the road to Damascus is long and winding, but if she can be led to embrace what she's unconsciously chosen for herself, maybe she's got a chance. The family has an extensive file here at the hospital. Aha, mother was diagnosed manic depressant at this very institution about 10 years ago and shipped off for state psychiatric care. Dad signed the papers. She was sent to a former fort built in 1871, by the way, that had been converted to a mental ward, which involved pounding subjects with cold water from pressurized hoses. For a more primitive means of treating this illness, You'd have to refer back to the Victorians and Bedlam. <laughs> Astonishing. It gets worse. The daughter was herself admitted for comprehensive treatment for depression about two months after mom was sent to the snake pit. Nadine froze in school one day, standing at her locker, couldn't move. They found her locked in place between classes and had to carry her like a mannequin to the nurse's office. Not a full break. It turned out but a debilitating one requiring six weeks of treatment, including such classics as sleep and art therapy and a soupçon of Thorazine. After which, she was released to spend another six weeks in at-home supervised care with dad the undiagnosed alcoholic as her primary, whereas in a native village, the entire population would have cared for her. Equally, in 
compassionately around the clock. And they're the primitives. Don't get me started. That, of course, is the voice of the great Russ Tamblin, who will be back next year as Dr. Lawrence Jacoby when we come back. I wanted to read you his final paragraph here because it may clear up a, a mystery that may have bothered some of you all these years. Uh, final thought, a regret, really. Patient would have been a perfect candidate to test my new optical integration system. Uh, glasses with one red polarized lens for the right eye, one blue polarized lens for the left. My working theory being that the red spectrum slightly suppresses activity in the left or logical hemisphere, while the blue spectrum does the same in the spatial intuitive side of the brain, and that we're worn together, although it does tend to give reality a slightly purple tint. The patient tends to experience increased integration between the two spheres by increasing activity between the, within the corpus callosum and encouraging the two sides to work together. So you see, he did have a good reason for wearing those glasses. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to uh, thank you all for coming, and I want to answer a few questions before we get to writing books. I want to, just two final thoughts. One, keep supporting Powell's. These <laughs> independent bookstores are the lifeblood of a city, and we need them in every city we can get, and you've got a real gem here. So. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for supporting Powell's. Two, what's everybody going to do on November 8th? Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I don't want to make any recommendations, but if you follow me on Twitter, I think you know where I stand. Uh, number three, I, I want to share with you um, really the two secrets I've learned. I've been writing for over 40 years. And um, it's always nice to, I think, let people know what you've learned over a lifetime. One, um, don't tell everything at once. And now let's answer some questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this one right here. Um, the show you worked on after Twin Peaks with David was on the air. Yes, it was. Briefly, <laughs> yeah. Briefly. <laughs> so is that ever going to be released on home video? There's uh -huh. been... Uh, <laughs> Serious discussion about this, and, and maybe when we get around to releasing the DVDs of the upcoming series, that might could be a, a possible extra, we'll see. They're just sitting there waiting, and uh, I just showed the pilot to my 12-year-old the other day, and <laughs> fell off the chair laughing. I mean, it's really crazy. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I hope, I hope we will have a chance to get that out there. Yes? What yes. was your, what was your oh, favorite yes. character to create? My favorite character to create, um, it's a hard question to answer. It's like asking me what's my favorite child, uh, but I only have one child. So, uh, uh, My favorite character to write, um, I really had three, it, and you heard some of them, each of them tonight, except Agent Cooper being number one. Um, remember that when he tells the strange dream about falling asleep and, and dreaming that he was eating a delicious gumdrop and wakes up and discovers he's eating one of his earplugs. <laughs> that happened to me. <laughs> uh, uh, number two, I, I loved Dr. Jacoby. Loved, loved, loved. I loved Russ Tamblin. Um, I loved that character. Uh, he was hardly even in the pilot, and we didn't even know who or what he was going to be. And when Russ showed up, and he brought those glasses and the, the weirdest pair of green orthopedic shoes I've ever seen. And, and that gave me the, the impetus to write him. And then uh, Deputy Hawk, you know, um, he's just super cool. And you're really going to like where he ends up, I think, when we come back next year. Um, we got time for a few more questions. Yes? Any more plans for the seven or any of that work, like coming up with more? Any more plans Please. for The List of Seven? The List of Seven was my first book um, in 1993, I think. Uh, don't date uh, don't it. <laughs> I'm succeeded by The Six Messiahs. They're both books about Arthur Conan Doyle uh, and his friend Jack Sparks, who we will, you discovered while you read the book, was the model for Sherlock Holmes. Um, I have a third book blocked out, and I've always been meaning to write it. I've just been too busy. Uh, and I hope to someday go back and visit it. We've almost made the movie three separate times, um, and I always thought I would write the third book if we got the movie made. There's now talk that we may turn it into a TV series, so 
the, for your well, fans. Then, list I'm of sorry. Seven. Then with that, was that any help for you into the junior series? The the, the Paladin uh, prophecy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, not. No. Uh, I mean, uh, but well, just keeping that kind of vein of kind of mystery and yeah, that sort of thing. Kind, yeah. yeah um, I wrote a, a young adult trilogy uh, over the last four or five years for Random House, and that came about because my then nine-year-old came up to me one day and said, Dad, why don't you write a book that I want to read? <laughs> uh, so I did, and he, and he read all three of them. Uh, which so he's are, read three books? That's three of the five that he's read. <laughs> um, so that turned out well. Anybody else? Yes, right here. Um, to write a book this way, does this take a lot longer than a normal book, or is this about the same? I mean, to put in, put, I mean, all these little extra things. Uh, this took about a year from start to finish, and that's really? a, that's, that's kind of awesome. that's about normal for me. But um, uh, it was a lot of research, obviously, and, and finding all those voices. The the advantage was I already knew all the Twin Peaks characters, so they were already in place. But um, it was a very intense year of work. And then a very intense six months working with the design team to create the template for all these documents that, that comprise the book, and uh, they did a wonderful job. So yeah, yeah it was a fun it was to a, rethink this way. It was a labor of love. It was really fun. Um, yes, I saw another hand. Yeah, right there. Uh, about how much of the book would you say is carryover from work that you did originally in the series, maybe background that you had already done, versus maybe unique to this project? Well, you know, we, we were uh, thinking at the time that we were going to do a third season. In fact, ABC had given us reason to believe they were going to pick it up. Um, and then they dashed our hopes. Uh, <laughs> doggone it. But, but that set the stage for this weird 25-year pause and the return. So I guess things all worked out. Um, I would say that maybe 20% of the book ha I had mapped out at some point, given the way I was thinking about what was to come, and um, the rest of it just sort of came when I sat down. We have time for a couple more questions. Yes? Um, I was really impressed with the way you incorporated like historical people throughout history, like the, I don't know, I'm trying to avoid spoilers or anything, but like certain people that feature in Milford's story throughout. Yes his course working with the government and so forth, um, only to find out that the stuff you included in regards to their interest in UFOs and other things turned out to be true. And I thought that was really neat to learn that about them. Yeah. And um, I wondered if that was just specific for the book or would you always had sort of an interest in like following these types of people and the leanings they had towards these um, subjects? Uh, did everybody hear that question? Yeah. Um, number one, I, I had started working and blending fact and fictional characters, factual and real people, in the list of seven um, many years ago. There, uh, that book has people like Bram Stoker and Madame Blavatsky and others who are part of the story. Queen Victoria even makes a cameo. So I've always enjoyed the idea of uh, just kind of blending fact and fiction and, and creating something that warps your perception of both. So this was a perfect opportunity to do that. and. There are many people from the real world who show up here, um, and uh, some of them even did the things that I said they did. That's what I said. That's what I thought yeah. Uh, that, no, that. Go off and read something else. It's like, oh wow, that's actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it'll be helpful to you to have the Googler nearby when you're, when you're, when you're reading this. Um, we have one more. One more question. Is it time for one more? Yes, sir. Um, which kind of came first, the scripts you penned with David, the book, or were they kind of done in tandem? Uh, the scripts came first. We um, we finished the scripts, we set up the the uh, show at Showtime, and then I said, and I want to do this. So I started right after that, and uh, finished, I guess, last January, um, in, in order to get it ready in time for this. So. Um, but one thing led right into the other, which was great preparation, because visiting all these characters again, everything was fresh in my mind. I mean, you guys probably remember a whole lot more about the series than I do at this point, because I literally had not watched it in 25 years, and um, it was kind of fun. I mean, I don't really like watching things that I've done before, because all I see are the mistakes. Um, there's a shadow boom, you know, or, God, he forgot his line that day, you know, so-and-so was sick, and. Um, so that's how 
I, I tend to watch things that I've worked on, but um, thank God you all kept watching it, and I'm really glad you did. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. It's a real thrill for me to see, see so many folks turn out, and um, let's sign some books. Thank you.